The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 14 After the keen, still days of September, the October sun filled the world with mellow warmth. Before Kit's eyes, a miracle took place for which she was totally unprepared. She stood in the doorway of her uncle's house and held her breath with wonder. The maple tree in front of the doorstep burned like a gigantic red torch. The oaks along the roadway glowed yellow and bronze. The fields stretched like a carpet of jewels, emerald and topaz and garnet. Everywhere she walked, the color shouted and sang around her. The dried brown leaves crinkled beneath her feet and gave off a delicious smoky fragrance. No one had ever told her about autumn in New England. The excitement of it beat in her blood. Every morning she woke with a new confidence and buoyancy she could not explain. In October, any wonderful unexpected thing might be possible. As the days grew shorter and colder, this new sense of expectancy increased and her heightened awareness seemed to give new significance to every common thing around her. Otherwise, she might have overlooked a small scent that once noticed, she would never entirely forget. Going through the shed door one morning with her arms full of linens to spread on the grass, Kit halted wary as always at the sight of her uncle. He was standing not far from the house, looking out toward the river, his face half turned from her. He didn't notice her. He simply stood idle for one rare moment, staring at the golden fields. The flaming color was dim now. Great masses of curled brown leaves lay tangled in the dry grass, and the branches that thrust against the graying sky were almost bare. As Kit watched, her uncle bent slowly and scooped up a handful of brown dirt from the garden path at his feet and stood holding it with a curious reverence as though it were some priceless substance. As it crumbled through his fingers, his hand convulsed in a sudden passionate gesture. Kit backed through the door and closed it softly. She felt as though she had eavesdropped. When she had hated and feared her uncle for so long, why did it suddenly hurt to think of that lonely, defiant figure in the garden? Judith's voice interrupted her groping thoughts. Hurry up, Kit, she called. That's the third group of people that have gone past the house. They say there's a trading ship coming up the river. If we finish the washing, we can watch it come in. Kit's heart leaped. What ship? What does it matter? It will bring mail and perhaps some new bolts of cloth and maybe the scissors we ordered from Boston. Anyway, it's fun to see a ship come in, and there won't be many more this fall. An odd confusion, half eagerness and half reluctance, tossed Kit's spirit to and fro. She was minded to stay at home and help Mercy, even as her feet hurried along the path beside Judith. But the moment they rounded the bend in the road, she forgot her uncertainty. There was the dolphin coming up the river with all her sails. The curving tail of the prow was chipped and dull. The hull was battered and knobby with barnacles. The canvas dark and weathered. Yet, how beautiful she was. In a surge of memories, Kit could almost feel the deck lifting beneath her feet and a longing, almost like homesickness, caught at her throat. How she would love to sail on the dolphin again. Forgotten was the smell of horses, the motionless waiting, the sudden terror of gale and lightning. She remembered only the endless shining reaches of the water that stretched to the end of the world, the vast arc of the Milky Way, and the scouring rush of salt wind that blew back her hair. What would she give to stand on the deck of the dolphin facing down the river, toward the open sea and Barbados. The dolphin rounded to, her topsails were furled, and with a great creaking of lines and shudder of canvas, she came to rest alongside the Weathersfield dock. The onlookers crowded forward as bales and barrels and knobby bundles 
were passed over the side into their eager hands. Kit and Judith stood a little aside, enjoying the bustling scene. The excitement of the crowd seemed to be contagious. When Judith spoke, Kit was surprised to find that her own lips were strangely unmanageable. A queer trembling made her clench her fists tight. She could not turn her eyes away from the deck of the ship. At last, she glimpsed a fair head emerging from a hatchway, almost hidden behind a vast load. It was some time before Nat Eaton, carelessly scanning the busy wharf, caught sight of her. Then he raised one hand in the briefest possible greeting. Kit knew how Nat could be when he was absorbed in the ship's business. She waited, pretending an interest in each bit of cargo that came over the rail. Gradually, the citizens of Wethersfield claimed their orders. The merchants from Hartsford counted off the barrels of nails and oil and salt, and only a handful of idlers still stood about. Come on, Kit, urged Judith. There's nothing more to see. No, Kit had to agree. There was not the slightest excuse for lingering further. With a little shrug, she turned away, and immediately she heard his voice. Mistress Tyler, wait a moment. She whirled back to see Nat bounding over the rail. He came toward her with his light, buoyant step, carrying under his arm a bulky package wrapped in a bit of sailcloth. Good day to you, Mistress Wood, he greeted Judith respectfully. Then he turned to Kit. Would you be kind enough to deliver a bit of cargo for me? The words were acceptable enough. It was the indifferent tone that was bewildering. Tis a length of woolen cloth I picked up for Hannah, he explained, holding out the package. Kit took it reluctantly. She'll be waiting for you to come yourself. I know, but my father is anxious to be off. Lose this wind and we'll be delayed here for days. Hannah might need this. If you can spare the time from your fashionable friends. Kit's mouth opened, but before she could speak, he went on. An interesting cargo we had this trip. One item in particular. Sixteen diamond pane windows ordered from England by one William Ashby. They say he's building a house for his bride. A hoity-toity young lady from Barbados, I hear. And the best is none too good for her. No oiled paper in her windows, no indeed. She was taken aback by the biting mockery in his voice. You might have mentioned it, Kit, he said, lowering his voice. There, there's nothing definite to tell. That order looks pretty definite. While she searched for something to say, she knew that his eyes had not missed the hot surge she could feel sweeping up from the collar of her cloak to the hood of her forehead. May I congratulate you, he said. To think, I worried about the little bird. I might have known it would gobble up a nice fat partridge in no time. Then, with a quick bow to Judith, he was gone. What bird? What was he talking about, panted Judith, breathlessly keeping up with Kit's sudden haste. Her head turned away to hide her angry tears. Kit did not answer. Honestly, Kit, you do know the oddest people. How did you ever meet a common riverman like that? I told you, he's the captain's son. Well, I certainly don't think much of his manners, observed Judith. To Kit's relief, a distraction awaited them at home. Rachel stood in the doorway, peering anxiously up the road. I declare, she fretted, there's no peace for a poor man. Someone came to fetch him just now, said a rider came up from Hartford with news this morning, and there's a great crowd at the blacksmith shop. Can you see anything up the road, Judith? No, said Judith. The square seems quiet. I think it is something to do with that Governor Andros of Massachusetts, the one who is determined to take the charter away. Oh, dear, your father will be so upset. Then let's get him a good dinner, suggested Judith practically. Don't worry, mother. The men can take care of the government. Following them into the house, Kit felt grateful to the unpopular Andros. Whatever he had done, he had saved her, for the moment at least, from any more of Judith's questions. 
Matthew Wood did not come home for the good meal they had made ready. Late in the afternoon, he came slowly into the kitchen. His shoulders sagged and he looked ill. What is it, Matthew? Rachel hovered over his chair. Has something terrible happened? Only what we have expected, he answered wearily. Governor Treat and the council have warded it off for nearly a year. Now Sir Edmund Andros has sent word three days since that he is setting out for Boston. He will arrive in Hartford on Monday to take over as royal governor in Connecticut. Lay a fire in the company room, he added. There are some who will want to talk tonight. One other chance bit of news reached them before nightfall. For all his haste, Captain Eaton had missed the wind after all, and the dolphin lay becalmed just off Wright's Island. Kit took a revengeful pleasure in the thought. She hoped they had a good long wait ahead of them. It would serve Nat Wright if they sat there till the ice set in. He might perfectly well have delivered his own package, and she would make very sure of one thing. She would take care not to deliver it herself till the dolphin was well on its way towards Saybrook. And we'll stop here and start on Chapter 15 next time. Thank you so much for listening. I do love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. <laughs>